Good morning. And thank you all for braving the bitter cold to be here this morning. On Friday, my daughter Lydia came home from preschool with a decorated brown paper sandwich bag stuffed with valentines. There was a lollipop and several Hershey kisses. One card had Hello Kitty and another had a bear with sunglasses and homemade cards with heart shapes cut out of red and pink and purple construction paper. This is the heart time of the year. It's the time of Valentine's Day, a day dedicated to love, a festival for the true romantic, but whether you're a lover or lonely in love or just a cool cynic about this whole love business, we still walk through a world exploding with roses and chocolates and cupids and hearts everywhere. And here it is in this heart time of the year that our own local community has been shaken by heartbreak, by the heartbreak of violence. Here in this heart time of the year, our hearts break for three students whose lives were senselessly taken. Our hearts ache for their families and for one another in this community. And here in this hard time of the year, we recognize the ways in which our society has grown heartless. With thousands of people, we marched in Raleigh yesterday calling for care for the poor and the sick, the exploited, the oppressed, and the disenfranchised. We called for a new heart, a heart big enough and strong enough to embrace all of God's children Amidst the heartbreak of violence, the heartache of loss, the heartlessness of indifference, let us feel the stirrings of love again in our bruised but beating hearts. Come, lovers of life, and stand with me for a time on the side of love. Come, let us worship together. Loving the hell out of the world. Love the hell out of the world is is actually a grassroots slogan that some contemporary Unitarian Universalists have adopted as an attention-grabbing encapsulation of our faith. Sure, it doesn't quite have the ring that standing on the side of love has. You won't find this slogan printed on bright yellow t-shirts or bright yellow banners. There's no hymn that goes by this name. One can only imagine how such a hymn would go. And yet, Love the Hell Out of the World is a slogan that has gained more traction within Unitarian Universalism than the effort to brand ourselves the uncommon denomination, a slogan that was printed on many unworn turquoise blue T-shirts and long-since-faded blue bumper stickers. Love the Hell Out of the World, as a slogan, I kind of like it. In the contemporary colloquialism of our culture, the term the hell out of is used as an intensifier. And so to love the hell out of means to love with intensity, passion, completeness, and thoroughness. And it's a slogan that also connects with our universalist heritage. The universalists believed that God was so loving and so merciful that every single human soul would be saved. And no one, absolutely no one, would be condemned to an eternity in hell. Our universalist forebears believed that if we truly felt and truly experienced this all-reconciling, all-redeeming love, we could not help but be inspired and compelled to love in turn, to replicate God's love and to work for a world where no one is oppressed or excluded from the whole human family. Just as God literally loved the hell out of the cosmic universe, we were supposed to love the hell out of the world. When I chose this sermon title about a month ago, I knew only what I was going to talk about in the vaguest of generalities. I had planned to talk about love this Valentine's weekend, but, but not love in its romantic sense or, or its erotic sense or its sentimental, mushy, mushy sense. How to leave something for future Valentine's Days. 
but rather I'd planned to talk this morning about love as a motive force compelling us to justice, a force of power, not mere distraction, as Mark Bellatini puts it, a force capable of changing and even transforming the world standing on the side of love, love the hell out of the world. When I selected this sermon title, I didn't know what particular form of hellishness I was going to use as a sermon illustration, but I did know that I would not lack for things to talk about. We never seem, we never seem to lack for ways that people here on earth manage to make life hellish for each other. And so I had no way of knowing when I selected such a sermon title that only a few days before Valentine's Day, our community would be rocked and shocked by the senseless violence that would make us here in Chapel Hill the focus of national and even international attention. I awoke on Wednesday morning to the news that three young Muslim students had been fatally shot by their neighbor in an apartment complex not far from campus. The hell of our world was close at hand. I want to share with you my immediate response. The first thing I thought of as I set about preparing to bring Lydia to preschool and then to come into work on Wednesday, I share this response not because I think it's wise or sophisticated or especially profound. My first thought was, now it's happened here. I immediately thought back to last April when miles from the church I was serving at the time, a man with ties to a white supremacist organization opened fire at a Jewish community center in the suburbs of Kansas City, killing three. I thought back to the summer of 2008 when a man who hated liberals walked into a multi-generational worship service at the UU Church in Knoxville, Tennessee, and shot nine, killing two. I thought back to 2012 when a white supremacist killed six at a Sikh Gurdwara in Wisconsin. I thought of movie theater shootings in Aurora and mall shootings in Columbia, university shootings at Virginia Tech, high school shootings in Littleton, elementary school shootings in Newtown. I thought of how tragic and enraging it is that I can stand here and rattle off a list how tragic and enraging it is that these are the events by which we mark time. And now, I thought, now it has happened here as if any community, as if any town could be insulated and inoculated against the possibility of such horror. This, my friends, is a form of hell the hell of living in a country, a society, where there are hundreds of millions of privately owned guns, and those guns are easily and cheaply available without restriction or encumbrance to virtually anyone, including members of hate groups, people with psychiatric illnesses, and people who are just plain filled with rage, who walk around with anger management issues, who are hot-tempered and generally prone to combative and antisocial behavior. And this form of hell further is largely one that we've chosen for ourselves. Let us not forget that our national response to something so evil as the slaughter of kindergartners, our national response was to pass legislation further relaxing gun restrictions, deregulating the gun industry, and further incentivizing gun ownership. Let us not forget that both major political parties, both Democrats and Republicans alike, lack the moral courage and conviction and political will to change our society's relationship with guns. They lack the will to approach the tens and thousands of firearm deaths that happen each and every year as an issue of public health that can be addressed through public policy and sensible legislation if only we were so willing. And the unwillingness leaves us in a state of hell the hell of families losing children, teens, young college students with their lives in front of them, 
the hell of any person, any person who may be the victim of a biased crime, knowing that white supremacists and neo-Nazis and anti-Semites and Islamophobes and homophobes and racists have limitless access to lethal weaponry. The hell of knowing that if you have someone in your life, a family member, a loved one, who is angry or unstable or difficult, that you may one day receive a call that that person has taken their own life or the lives of another. And this is just one form of hell, one form of hell amidst all the others in our world, amidst the hells of poverty and hunger and homelessness, mass incarceration, untreated illness, depression, domestic violence, warfare and torture and famine. My thinking, my recent thinking about heaven and hell has been largely influenced by a contemporary author, Rob Bell. Rob Bell is an evangelical Christian, albeit a heretical one. He's an evangelical Christian who's found himself caught up in a great deal of controversy due to his tendencies towards theological liberalism. His book from a few years ago, entitled Love Wins, a book about heaven, hell, and the fate of every person who ever lived, um, is a book in which he proclaims a nearly universalist theology. And his chapter on the nature of hell, he focuses on hell in a this-worldly sense and heaven in a this-worldly sense. He remembers arriving in Kigali, Rwanda in December 2002 and driving to an airport by his hotel. Soon after leaving the airport, he writes, I saw a kid, probably 10 or 11, with a missing hand standing by the side of the road. Then I saw another kid just down the street missing a leg, then another in a wheelchair. And by the time I reached my hotel, I must have seen 50 or more teenagers with missing limbs in just those few miles. His guide explained to him that during the genocide, one of the ways that people chose to degrade and humiliate their enemies was by taking a machete and removing a limb of a child. Rob Bell says, do I believe in a literal hell? Of course, those aren't metaphorical missing arms and legs. But still, Rob Bell insists that the cosmos is configured in such a way that love wins and that the literal this worldly hell can be met with and turned by a this worldly literal heaven. In Luke's gospel, we listen on a, on a theological argument. Man comes to ask Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus tells him to follow the law, love God and his neighbor as himself. The man asks, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus then tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. The man walking along the Jericho Road set upon by thieves who attack him and rob him and leave him beaten and bruised and bloodied in the ditch. And the wealthy of the world pass by him and the men of power and title and prestige pass by him. And finally, a man of lowly stature stops to attend to him bringing him to safety, dressing his wounds. The good Samaritan loves the hell out of this particular roadside ditch in the world, meets it through direct encounter, direct embrace, brings a bit of heaven to the hell. I've spoken so far largely about the hell part. Now I want to turn and talk about the love part for a bit. Perhaps I'm reading far too much into this little slogan. Perhaps I'm taking it all too literally. But I'd like to suggest that our central task as religious people is to love, is to love God and our neighbor as ourselves, is to love in such a way that the hell of the world is lessened, to encounter and to be present to each other in such a way that the hell of pain is lessened. Our central task is to be the love people. 
Different people put forward different ideas about how the hell of this world can be alleviated and transformed. Some say that we should police the hell out of the world or, or imprison the hell out of it or bomb the hell out of it or drone strike the hell out of it. Some say that we shouldn't do any of those things. We should just isolate ourselves from the hell of the world, take care of just ourselves. Let anyone beyond our walls fend for themselves as best they can. Some, like me, get hung up on legislating the hell out of the world and policying the hell out of the world and organizing and institutionalizing the hell out of the world. That's where I put my energy. I go there myself from time to time. And it's good and it's worth it. But no, I'd like to suggest that the central task that is ours is to love in such a way and to such an extent that the pain and suffering and fear and heartache and hell of the world is lessened by the virtue of our love's saving and transforming and redeeming power. It's been said that the opposite of love isn't hate. The opposite of love isn't hate or cruelty or violence or anger. We just think it's those things because they strike us, and so rightfully so, they strike us as the antithesis of love. But it's been said that the opposite of love isn't hate, but indifference. In the ancient parable, it is the Samaritan who embodies neighborly love because he does not merely pass by. He encounters. He does not look away with indifference. He encounters. He loves the stranger, the neighbor as himself. Forest Church writes of love, we pay for love with pain, he says, but love is worth the cost. If we try to protect ourselves from suffering, we shall manage only to subdue the very thing that makes our lives worth living. Though we can, by a refusal to love, protect ourselves from the risk of losing what or whom we love, the irony is that by refusing to love, we will have nothing left that is really worth protecting. The opposite of love is indifference. With love comes heartache and heartbreak. And so I'd like to tell you a story, a story I was once told about love's transforming power. It's a story whose truth I cannot verify, though it was told to me directly by a person who was there. The story takes place in suburban Denver in the late 1990s. It's the story of a teenage boy who came to the youth group of the small Unitarian Universalist Church in Littleton, Colorado. The boy came dressed in black, and he was angry and quiet and withdrawn. In the presence of the youth group over time, he opened up a little bit. He shared talking about feeling angry and lost, and about how he had been hanging around with his friends Dylan and Eric, but didn't want to give in to the darkness that they were giving in to. Over the next few months and years, he blossomed, softened, became more whole in the presence of love and acceptance. My friend tells me that he has no way of knowing but he is sure that he believes his church, that that youth group is the reason that there were two shooters and not three in Littleton. His church was the reason the loss of life was not exponentially greater. Love the hell out of the world. If we are to truly experience this all-reconciling, all-redeeming love, we will be inspired and compelled to love in turn, to encounter in turn, to move towards others, and to give love. We called to replicate God's love to work for a world where no one is oppressed or excluded from the human family. I ask you as you go forth to go forth and encounter 
to be the love people to one another, to be the love people to those who are lonely and who are hurting, to be the love people walking down that Jericho road. Such a love will not insulate us, will not inoculate us from evil in this world. But it will do our part. It will do our part to redeem those who are hurting. Go forth in courage. Go forth in love. And amen.